Well, hi, everybody. Welcome to the Alad Pod. We have a wonderful special guest here, Professor Fred Smith Jr. from Emory University School of Law. We'll be talking about qualified immunity, civil rights litigation in general, and as always, we're here to answer your questions. So if you're watching right now, wherever you're watching it from, please share the video. It's very helpful for us because we get the word out to more people. We get more folks engaged and learning about all of these things, accountability and policing and government. Uh, it's really important. Uh, so this is supposed to be an educational thing, a community thing. So if you are on uh, Facebook, it's really easy to just share it. If you're on Twitter, heck, retweet the thing, whatever you do over there. Uh, but we are also on YouTube and at aladgross.live. You can put your questions into the comment section. We see those. And if you are on the website, you'll be able to text a number. That's my number right here. So go ahead. Tell us where you're watching from. Let us know. And if you've got any questions already, go ahead and put them in the, uh, in the comment section. We'll be right back and we'll be starting in just a little bit. Thank you for watching. All right, folks, welcome to the Alad Pod. My name is Alad Gross. I'm running for Attorney General of Missouri. This is Mr. Toby over here. Political consultants from out of state directing his office. And we paid for it. And this time we'll be donating it to a school in Kansas City. It is Ms. Mangus's classroom. Gross says he's doing all of this to enforce Missouri's sunshine law and get transparency and accountability to, quote, fix our democracy. If we have a healthier community, or, or state rather, right. we will have a, a, a more viable workforce. This is an opportunity for us to look into our hearts and see who we want to be when we come out of it. What do we want to tell future generations about the great pandemic of 2020 and what we did and how we were there for each other? Well, hi, everybody. Welcome to the Alad Pod. We are very excited to have our special guest here, Professor Fred Smith Jr. from Emory University School of Law. Today, we'll be talking about accountability in our justice system, specifically around qualified immunity in federal litigation, what that means in the civil rights world, and how that will impact you know, any of the policy steps that we use moving forward. So really excited to have him. Uh, if you're watching right now, I know some folks already have. Uh, they put their comments uh, on screen. So hi, Angie, and hi, Michael. Thanks for, for showing up and watching. 
Uh, if you're here, let us know where you're watching from. Uh, and you can put your questions into the comment section right there. We can see them live and we can get answers to your questions. This is a town hall designed for you and to get your engagement in the process. So without any more wasting our time, let's get our guest on. Make sure he is still here. All right, Professor, are you there? Hi there. Hello. Hi. Welcome to the Allowed Pod. We're very excited to have you all the way from, are you in Atlanta right now? I am in Atlanta. Absolutely. Great. Yeah, well, thanks, thanks for for you know traversing the very far internet cable to get here. We really appreciate it. Um, how are, how are you doing today? Things are great. Good. You know? Well, I'm 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 very excited to have you, uh, mostly because um, I've always I always wanted since I was a kid I always wanted to be a constitutional law attorney. Um, I was one of those kids, and uh, I had you know a lot of folks told me, hey, uh, that's not really a thing. Not that many people do this. Uh, you probably won't get to do that. And uh, well, I, I had a wonderful opportunity to work at the Attorney General's office here in Missouri, and that's pretty much all I did. And it's very exciting, and I've been able to do that since uh, with a lot of civil rights litigation here. So uh, I know you're a constitutional law professor. Uh, tell us a bit about yourself. How how in the world did you make it uh, to this one? What what made you want to do it? Yeah. Uh, so again, so thank you for having me today. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, in terms of uh, teaching constitutional law, uh, I think it started with law itself well before it was uh, an excitement about constitutional law. In the fourth grade, there was a mock trial of Hansel and Gretel, where I was sharp <laughs> I was supposed to defend uh, Hansel and Gretel. Uh, and that, uh, that sort of whet my initial appetite <laughs> for this thing called law. Um, and uh, you know, at some point when I was in college, I realized that um, that I really liked writing, that I really liked asking questions, that I really liked trying to figure out what the right answer was, that I really liked people challenging me about what the right answer was, and like collectively um, trying to come to a solution and uh, controlling for all sorts of variables and and the like. That was actually something I really enjoyed. So by the time I went to law school, uh, I knew I wanted to be a law professor, and then. Um, had the great fortune of having Pam Carlin as my constitutional law professor my first year. Uh, and that was that. I was hooked. Yeah. Uh, she was a fantastic uh, teacher and, and litigator. And uh, it's probably not shocking that given that she has written about and teaches things like constitutional torts, um, that that's where uh, that that's where my career has gone. I, I didn't have the pleasure of having her for election law, or else that would probably be part of my my <laughs> repertoire too. Uh, but basically, everything she taught me, I'm now teaching, uh, and uh, and uh, and so yeah, that's that's kind of how this sometimes works. That's that's really great. I mean, you know, it's it's so interesting uh, how much. I mean, we all know this, but how much teachers and educators really shape you know, what we get interested in and where we go, especially when you have a good one and someone who knows what they're doing. It's pretty, it's a pretty special thing. Sure. Yeah. So that's, sure. that's great. So, so, okay. So you're, you're in law school, you're doing this thing, you're taking this client. I'm like, wow, this is, this is really great. How, how, like, what's the next thing? Cause I know, you know, there's a big draw for folks. Um, and you, you, you did work in the private sector for a bit, but like, what, what was your path to get into, uh, teaching? Yeah. So, um, yeah, again, so I knew from the moment I got to law school that I wanted to be a, a law teacher. And so um, I wasn't shy about saying so. So, uh, so my, my, my professors knew that that's uh, what I was interested in and what excited me. And the good, and the good thing about being so uh, upfront about that, there were kind of two things. Number one, you know, I was at Stanford. I wasn't, um, I wasn't at a school where basically everyone wants to be a law professor. At Stanford, lots of people want to do lots of different types of things. Um, and so, uh, as a result, right, when you express, you know, what, what your lane is, you're not kind of, you know, competing with a whole bunch of people who want to do the exact same thing. Um, but also it meant that, you know, they could, the professors could kind of give me some guidance about what I needed to do, right? And the, and the, the answer was essentially write, 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 take writing classes and write and, uh, and get to know your professors and, and didn't do some more writing uh, and, <laughs> uh, and, you know, and, and presumably clerk. Um, so uh, for me, my, it's the third paper I wrote um, was about sovereign immunity. Mm. And uh, I wasn't planning to go on the teaching market, but um, factors beyond my uh, expectations came to be. And we don't really need to get into the details about that because that's not yeah. what this is about. Okay. Um, and uh, and but, you know, but, but uh, people were 
responsive to that particular uh, article about sovereign immunity, and and they would ask me, um, also, do you are, are you going to teach Fed courts? Do you want to teach Fed courts? And I had thought about this myself as a constitutional law person, um, but it was very clear to me I wanted a job, and that if they were asking, oh, so it's obvious you're going to teach Fed courts, right? The answer was yes, you're going to teach federal. I'm going to teach federal courts. <laughs> right. um, and uh, but little did I know that that really was what uh, what much about what excites me about the law um, is um, is the way that um, procedure really sometimes is used in ways that blocks access to justice. And so it's really important to have uh, a great deal of focus on how do we uh, make sure that we unclog those particular blockages. And so um, and so yeah, so that's how I wound up where I am. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, yeah, I think, you know, having litigated a lot of these cases, and we talked a little bit before we started, um, when I was at the Attorney General's office, I did a lot of uh, constitutional cases that involved different immunities and everything else. But it's really interesting how much in the law procedure really determines a lot of what the outcomes are, even if you would think like, you know, fairness would demand something else. Um, procedure is, is a very big deal in the law and has a very big impact on what what the results end up being. Um, you know, you mentioned sovereign immunity. I think there are a lot of folks who, you know, would think, well, sovereign immunity, that's an interesting concept for America that fought against the sovereign. It was very much like, oh, let's not have a king anymore. Um, could, you tell, could you tell us a bit about what sovereign immunity is um, and why do we have it in our legal system? Yeah, so in the federal system, uh, sovereign immunity uh, stands essentially for the proposition that uh, you can't sue the state, um, but for some limited circumstances, right? So you can't sue the state without its consent or uh, unless you know Congress has uh, allowed for it. And then even when Congress has allowed for it, there's a very narrow set of circumstances in which Congress can do that. Um, and uh, in terms of where it came from, um, most people attribute it to kind of this broader notion that uh, the king can do no wrong. Um, so you couldn't sue the king without the king's consent in the king or queen's court. Uh, and so it's kind of understood to be a fundamental attribute of, uh, of sovereignty. So early, very early in the life of the republic, um, there was an attempt to sue the state of Georgia at the United States Supreme Court. Uh, there are some creditors from South Carolina and, and Great Britain who wanted to sue uh, and um, the Supreme Court um, said that that could happen. Um, and in some of the rulings, uh, in some of the opinions by the justices, they said things like, kind of very similar to what you just said. They said, uh, Georgia is not a sovereign, that, that we live in a, uh, in a republic where the people are sovereign. Um, and so, you know, I'm thinking about James Wilson's opinion in particular, where in all caps, N-O-T, not a sovereign, he says. <laughs> Um, but what then happened is that uh, the the people passed the 11th Amendment, um, which uh, doesn't actually say that states have sovereign immunity, but it has been interpreted that way. So it limits the circumstances in which people can sue states. And um, the late, great Justice Scalia, um, I mean, great in terms of his um, his effect on uh, on law and on federal courts in particular, uh, he said the 11th Amendment stands not for what it says, but for the broad proposition that it represents that states enter the union with their sovereignty intact. And so the 11th Amendment has come to stand as evidence, uh, evidence that states are in fact uh, sovereign. And that's kind of where the doctrine sits today. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, that is... I know because we're, we're talking about qualified immunity, and there's there's some other ones. There's also absolute immunity, but those are all separate. Um, I know a lot of folks are, are interested in, in qualified immunity right now. Um, we've even gotten uh, a question about it, but before we get there, um, maybe some like foundational work on it. But it even makes sense because one of the questions, so I'll put it on the screen, but Sarah, who's watching from St. Louis City, um, asked, is there anywhere in the U.S. that doesn't have qualified immunity when did qualified immunity start? So I guess if you could, um, because that's a particular question about the the doctrine itself. But what is qualified immunity? How is it? It's how is it different or related to sovereign immunity? Um, and yeah, I mean, wh why is this a thing that we have uh, in the system right now? Yeah. So sovereign immunity tends to we tend to associate that with when somebody wants to sue the government, right? So when when, when somebody wants to sue 
the state of Missouri um, or uh, the city of Kansas City. Um, that, and under those circumstances, we think about that as suing the entity. Um, and when you're wanting to sue the state, right, uh, in federal court, um, they're entitled to sovereign immunity. There's also actually lots of barriers to suing the city as well. And I've, I have an article where I call that local, where I call that local sovereign immunity. Mm -hmm. uh, but, uh, but it's not always described that way. Um, and so, uh, but, but we tend to associate that with when you sue an entity, when you sue the government. Um, absolute immunity and qualified immunity, those tend to kick in when you want to sue the government official, right? You want to sue the individual who violated uh, your rights and you want to sue them for, for damages. That's when these immunities kick in the most. Um, and so uh, if someone wants to sue a prosecutor, the uh, prosecutors um, who are acting as prosecutors, they get absolute immunity for all of those sorts of actions. Okay. Um, if someone wants to sue a judge, um, they get absolute immunity for all acts that are taken in one's judicial capacity or judicial role. Um, and everyone else essentially, or actually, sorry, and legislators, legislators also get absolute immunity, right? So we have these three categories where people get absolute immunity. Um, there's also the president, but that's kind of its own thing. Um, but you know, for, the, for, the, for the folks we're kind of encountering on a regular basis who are kind of in better positions to violate our, uh, our rights one-on-one -on -one as opposed to um, uh, undermining the entire republic at the same time. Um, for, for those individuals, prosecutors, judges, um, and, uh, and legislators, um, they get absolute immunity. In addition, then uh, every other government official gets qualified immunity. And that's the one that's been, of course, in the news more recently. That's the one that the Supreme Court recently, uh, some justices have expressed some doubts about. Um, and that's the one where uh, Congresswoman Presley and Congressman Amash, uh, I believe I'm saying that right, um, yeah. uh, from Michigan, um, where they uh, have a bill to try to eradicate qualified immunity in some circumstances. Now, all of that said, I still haven't answered. Well, what is <laughs> Right. Um, because for, but I think it's important because first you have to figure out who, do, who are we even talking about? What are we talking about? Right. right. Um, and so when someone wants to sue a government official in their individual capacity, who's not a judge, not a legislator and not a prosecutor, um, and you want to sue them for damages, uh, then uh, you have to demonstrate two things. You have to demonstrate that they violated uh, a constitutional right. OK, so far, so good. Um, but uh, but you also have to demonstrate in order to really kind of uh, to hold them liable. And this is the, the tricky part. You have to show that they violated clearly established law that a reasonable person would have known at the time of the violation. Um, and what that really ends up meaning uh, in many cases, not all, but in many cases, what that ends up meaning is that you have to show uh, that there is another case that's already been decided. Uh, where where the court has already said that this exact set of this essentially this exact set of circumstances violate the constitution um so you have to find some earlier case with they call it materially similar facts all right so very very similar facts where there's been a violation found in the past um and if you can't do that then in in in, in most cases that's going to mean that um it's going to be very difficult to overcome qualified immunity um and uh, and part of the difficulty here um, is that many courts skip the first question because they can. They just skip directly to the question, is it clearly established, right? Because right. why spend the time answering, is it a constitutional violation if you're ultimately, if the punchline is you can't sue? So, so a lot of courts just say, eh, not clearly established. Uh, and so you have a bunch of cases in a row where it's like, not clearly established. Oh, still not clearly established. Oh, gee. Oh, wait, it's still not clearly established. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and it can go on and on and on like that. Um, and so um, so that's but that's essentially that's that's qualified immunity. And that's why it's so controversial, especially in the context of excessive force, um, because, you know, if these circumstances are not established in case after case, it's not very evident where else the law will get developed. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's a bit because this is something that comes up early in litigation. Um, and, and the idea behind it is. And this is the argument that the state or you know whatever entity will make is that uh, oh well this is an immunity from being sued which means we don't have to go through the whole process we don't have to collect the evidence we don't have to come to all these decisions we stop at the very beginning because otherwise there's all these costs associated with it so the doctrine the idea behind qualified immunity 
from the uh, the cost perspective of the state is to just shut it down before it really even gets to going. That is the idea, right? Yeah. So um, this tends to happen yeah, very early in the litigation, um, you know, um, a motion to dismiss or what's called summary judgment. So yeah, very early in the litigation. Um, and yeah, and as you point out, that's the point. So in uh, um, this this doctrine as we know it today was in was invented in uh, in the year 1982 in a case called Harlow versus uh, Fitzgerald. And the court said that what it was doing was attempting to balance competing principles. Uh, it's trying to create a doctrine that um, won't scare government officials from doing their jobs, while also um, scaring government officials from acting in an unconstitutional manner, in an unconstitutional way, right? So there's these kind of, um, it's trying to get this perfect balance when it comes to deterrence. Um, and this is where they landed. Uh, and the idea was uh, that, you know, in many cases, um, it can deter government officials from doing their job to even really have to go to trial, mm -hmm. right? Or in some instances to have to sit for a deposition, but certainly um, to get to the point where they are, you know, in the courtroom every day and so forth. And now, there's a lot of empirical assumptions that are just, uh, sometimes when I talk about the doctrine and why it exists, it's <laughs> I'm, like I find myself saying things that, that don't make much sense because <laughs> there's a work to the doctrine that doesn't make much sense, right? So mm -hmm. if, you, if you're suing the city, guess what, right? Like. If there's not a map that's sitting at the defendant's table, uh, there's not a map of the city that's taking the stand. It's a human being, um, and so it's not it's not really evident <laughs> that having like a radically different doctrine when you're suing the city because oh my goodness they're gonna have to answer questions. It turns out they're still gonna have to answer questions um, to the extent that you allow suits against the entity as well. And so there there's um, there's a, there is there's a lot of uh, um, there's a lot of ways that qualified immunity doesn't really match up with empirical realities. Um, uh, and Joanna Schwartz uh, at, at, um, at UCLA has done a great job of illustrating some of those empirical realities. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, because what often happens in these cases is that it's not like you're just suing one person. Oftentimes you're suing, you know, just like you said, the, the municipal entity or whatever it might be. And there's somebody who's going to have to represent them, too. Um, and, you know, if they're in and they're still in and somebody's going to have to do a lot of the work there. Um, you know, I, I think one one question that I've seen quite a bit, um, that I think there's some misunderstanding around is the qualified immunity. And if you, you know, all of a sudden got rid of this thing and said that, uh, you know, folks could be sued. One, you can get past qualified immunity. So it's not like qualified immunity is absolute and gets rid of everything. Uh, but two, a lot of folks are, well, are you going to make, you know, the, the law enforcement officer or whoever's working for the state, are you going to make them now personally liable? Are they going to have to pay that money right from them? And, and at least in my experience, what most often happens is that the municipality itself indemnifies those folks. And then that's where the money is really coming from. Um, unfortunately, right. a lot of a lot of situations, I mean, one, that's it's probably, you know, there's some accountability piece from the governing structure there, but two, you know, we just don't pay our public servants very much anyway, so there's not going to be much compensation you can get from somebody if you're suing them just directly for whatever money they have in their bank account. Yeah, that's right. So in 99.8% of cases, um, and this is what Joanna Schwartz showed in, a, in an article in 2014 in, uh, in NYU Law Review, in 99.8% of cases, uh, police officers are indemnified when they're found liable. So the city is paying, not the officer. Um, yeah, so that and, and so that's another kind of just built in. Uh, there's a lot of assumptions built into the. It's not just built into the public. It's built into the doctrine. And the doctrine seems to assume that uh, the public servants are going to be paying this out of pocket. Um, but in terms of the empirical reality, at least in the context of police officers, um, and this may be true more broadly. I'm just not aware of any study on how often this happens more broadly. Mm -hmm. uh, you represent in your experience in most cases, and that that comports with my understanding as well. Um, but we know that in the context of police officers, it's 99.8% uh, of the cases are indemnified by the government, and so um, and so that's right. They're not going to actually be the ones paying it out of pocket, uh, mm -hmm. and so it's just another place for qualified immunity um, uh, is built on 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 false foundations. Um, and it, but it also is a reason why, in my view, it's important to think about this. Um, collectively, um, like I know that there's a lot of attention on qualified immunity, and I get it. Uh, I'm I'm glad that there is, um, but qualified immunity is just one one 
one piece of this broader puzzle. Um, and if you fix just one little piece, like, you, you know, you, you could end up with a, with a puzzle that still looks really funky and that still has some holes in it. And so um, it, it strikes me that thinking about um, this is a great opportunity to think about, well, when do we want people to be able to sue cities and when do we not? Um, and when do we want people to be able to sue states? And when do we not? And when do we want people to be able to sue prosecutors? And when do we not? Um, because this is, this is, it, these things really, they kind of work together. Um, and it may be less important whether or not you can sue the officer if you can sue the city in some instances. Uh, and so, so I think thinking about these collectively, thinking about how these doctrines operate synergistically um, is a good idea. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, I agree. I mean, it's, it's, it seems like, I mean, we're going to need and folks, I think, you know, now way more, so, you know, I've been pretty involved in, in a lot of these justice issues for, for a long time now. And it seems like this moment, there's so much more consensus over something having to be different. And I think, you know, if, if we can broaden that perspective of what this really looks like, um, you know, there's a lot of different systems that people are a little bit less familiar with, but that really have a huge impact in what's going on right now. And I think that's, a, you know, a great, great way to visualize it. Um, you know, one of the, so one of the, the first question that Sarah had, and this has been something that actually kind of came up in St. Louis City not very long ago, but her question in the beginning was, is there anywhere in the U.S. that doesn't have qualified immunity? Are, are there places that um, have said, hey, I mean, I don't know, maybe you know, um, but have said, hey, we're not going to use this as a defense, like voluntarily saying we're not going to do qualified immunity anymore? That's super interesting. So, yeah. so a couple of um, so first, one thing to keep in mind is that the, the doctrine that we're talking about today, so far at least, has been about suits in federal court, right? So suits uh, based on federal law. Well, actually, I should say it more precisely. We were talking about suits that are based in federal law, so uh, based in violations of the federal constitution. Um, and so um, a state doesn't really have the, it's not apparent at least that states have the authority to kind of entirely do away with it um, because it's, it's, a, it's a defense that's been created by the federal government and by, by in particular by courts through the common law. Um, and so it's not apparent that they would be able to do that. Now that said, um, what they absolutely do have the ability to do is govern what happens with respect to their own state law. Uh, and so when it comes to state law, states across the country have very different uh, doctrines around qualified and absolute immunity. Uh, you know, and so it, it's hard to even describe the trends because there's there's just there's a lot of different variations. Um, Colorado, uh, however, did just get qualified immunity with respect to state lawsuits. Um, and so that is one potential um, avenue. Now, um, your question is a little different, right? Which is, could a state say, well, we're, we're never going to assert this? I'd say that the, the, the best way to answer that is we don't know because, to my knowledge, it's never happened quite that way. There are lots of cases, though, and Joanna Schwartz has shown this, too. So she's done a lot of empirical research in this space. Uh, so she has a piece last year from Yale Law Journal um, that um, that explores how often qualified immunity gets asserted, and she actually finds that there's lots and lots of cases where nobody ever nobody ever brings it up, uh, and it's unclear whether that is based in some deep principle against it, uh, or whether or not um, there are some lawyers who didn't take fake courts. Uh, but in any event, um, there's lots of cases where it doesn't come up. Uh, but whether a state could say, local officials, when you are sued, you can never assert. You're not allowed to assert qualified immunity when you are sued, even though it's kind of an individual immunity that is granted to you. Um, that's that. That seems like that would be a harder, uh, a harder road to hoe. Right. Yeah. It was uh, in in St. Louis City. There was some discussion. Uh, between the uh, uh, president of the board of aldermen, the mayor, and uh, the comptroller, um, and there was a resolution put forward about uh, basically trying to eliminate qualified immunity. And I guess that would have been like the defense on behalf of the city, uh, where I guess it would be city employees in that situation. Um, but it was interesting because it was an interesting discussion and something that I hadn't, you know, totally thought of. It's like, oh well, we're going to have this policy here to say we're not asserting it, and uh, you know, it'd be an interesting kind of way to look at that. Um, do you think, I mean, do you think from, 
I don't know. I mean, it, it seems like and we did have a question about like any developments. Uh, it came from AJ um, about any developments at the uh, Supreme Court level. Because I know there, there were some, you know, opinions that were going up um, in some cases that were going up. But have there been any recent developments that make you think that um, qualified immunity as a doctrine is receiving less or more support from uh, the federal court system? Yeah, right. So first, actually, toward the end there, when you talked about what um, what a local government did, I mean, I suppose you could have a law that said we're not going to indemnify you, or you could you could make a make it as a part of contracts that right. you don't indemnify if qualified immunity is asserted. But but that, I mean, it, it's sort of funky. It's sort of weird, right? Mm-hmm. Because you're because. <laughs> Different people have different roles in the system, and when you are the lawyer for the government, right, it's it's hard to imagine that you're like, how do I make it easier to get sued? That's not really typically how we think about uh, the role of city attorney. But but put putting putting that to one side, um, uh, yeah. So in terms of broader developments in the federal courts and in uh, the Supreme Court, so I suppose I'll start with the Supreme Court. Um, there are so the justice who has suggested that he is most willing to revisit the doctrine of qualified immunity is Justice Thomas, um, and this is on textualist grounds, right? So um, it's made up, uh, and, and I, when I say made up, I actually don't even mean that in a disparaging way. I just it just it just is. It's, it's, it's an doctrine, um, <laughs> and I don't, I don't like me saying that doesn't mean that I'm saying, and therefore it's illegitimate. I'm not taking that next step. Um, that's, that's for other, you know, that's, you know, for, 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 for a very strict textualist though. Um, uh, and justice Scalia, justice, justice Thomas mm-hmm. is a textualist. Um, it's deeply concerning to him that this is entirely made up by judges and that it bears no relationship with the text or the history of section 1983. And so he's shown a willingness, uh, in an opinion, a concurring opinion called Ziegler versus Abbasi. Uh, from 2017, and then more recently, he wrote um, just last week. He wrote a dissent from a um, in a denial of what's called denial of certiorari, where the court says they're not going to hear a case. He wrote something saying that he would have heard the case uh, and laid out um, why it's time to revisit qualified immunity. Yeah. Um, so he's been the most vocal. Um, uh, now, there's other justices who have been very vocal uh, about not so much about whether it should exist at all, but about whether or not it's overly protective uh, of government officials at the expense of constitutional rights. And I'd say the leader on that score has been Justice Sotomayor, um, who happens to be my former boss. Um, and so they're the, these two, they're, they're sort of the two um, uh, folks on the court who have shown the, the greatest willingness to revisit the, the doctrine. In lower courts, um, you have um, courts that have, uh, there have been fights in the lower courts about this. Um, judge Willette, um, who is a Trump appointee, quite conservative judge on the Fifth Circuit, has been a very sharp critic of qualified immunity, again, on the textualist basis. And then you have judges on the Fourth Circuit uh, who have recently, you know, they said, look, we have to do this. But, you know, Judge Wynn wrote an op-ed, I believe in the New York Times or the Washington Post, one of them. Uh, And then there was an opinion within the last month uh, that, or within the last few weeks that talked about, in its conclusion, talked about George Floyd, talked about Ferguson, Mm -hmm. uh, and talked about how this doctrine is deeply incompatible with the moment that we're in. And and it's, it's, I've actually written, um, a few years ago, I wrote a piece called Formalism, Ferguson, and the Future of Qualified Immunity about these two tensions, like these two, these these, these actors that are coming at this from very different places, um, but their interests are kind of converging around potentially revisiting qualified immunity. Mm. All of that said, the court last week had nine cases before them. Uh, this was on Monday. Uh, nine cases before them with respect to whether to revisit qualified immunity. And they denied the, the vast majority of them, and they uh, have not yet granted any of them. Um, and in those cases, you know, what people were asking, including, I, you know, full disclosure, I was on um, amicus briefs in uh, at least one of those cases. Um, what people what people were asking um, in those cases was, hey, well, you say you want to revisit it. Here are some cases, right? Um, so there was a case uh, we didn't file in this particular case, but um, there was a meaning we the 
the law, the conservative and liberal law professors who have been writing amicus briefs in these cases. We didn't file on a case out of the 11th Circuit, but there was a case here in Georgia where an officer shot at a dog who didn't constitute any threat. Uh, he was at the wrong, the officer was at the wrong house to begin with, shot at uh, this woman's family dog, missed the dog, hit a 10 year old kid. Mm. And the 11th Circuit said, well, but he was trying to shoot the dog. And we don't have any case law about when you can shoot a dog. We only have case law about when you can shoot a human. So um, so even if this was a violation of the Constitution, it wasn't a violation of clearly established law. Um, there was a, a case out of the Ninth Circuit where officers had a key to an apartment because the owner of the apartment gave the officer the key, or the occupant of the apartment gave the officer the key, said, you can come in, you have consent to come in. The officers decided that's not the way they wanted to do it. Uh, they didn't have the, quite the element of surprise that they wanted for the person who they thought was in the home, wrongly was in the home. And they shot shot into the home and put tear gas into the house. Uh, and so the person who, who lived actually lived there couldn't live in the house for two months um, because the officers took this particular step. And uh, the Ninth Circuit, which is a quite liberal court, the, the Ninth Circuit said, well, and we have other cases where there was a lot of destruction in the home as a result of kind of overzealous uh, actions to enter a home. But in one of those other cases, the officer said that uh, they did it because it was cool. And here the officers didn't say they did it because it was cool. They said they did it because they thought that the person might have a BB gun. So, you know, mm -hmm. there's, there's, a, there's, and these are, I mean, there's a case out of the Fifth Circuit, which they haven't denied. Um, so maybe that's what they have their eye on. I don't know. Um, where uh, someone for days was uh, forced, a prisoner forced to to lay in feces and urine. Mm -hmm. um, and they said, well, we have these cases that say you couldn't do that for weeks, but this is this is just days. And so, um, and so uh, there, there's no shortage of cases uh, for the Supreme Court if it's, um, to, you know, to revisit this. Um, I don't know what's happening because I'm not there. Uh, and if I was there, I couldn't say, right? So um, I don't know why this is, uh, why they're not biting, but it may be that they are waiting for Congress and that they think that Congress can come up with a better solution. And frankly, I'm not sure they're wrong on that. It may be that Congress can come up with a better solution than they can. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's a legislative fix to that. I do, you know, it, it just seems, it's interesting. And, and Michael had a question um, on here. It was a little bit, uh, it was it was about subjective emotion. I'll put it on the screen too, because that way I won't be mischaracterizing anything. But can you address how subjective emotion simplifies or complicates the issues around qualified immunity? How do we identify objective standards to help clarify? And I, I, you know, I think it's it's also interesting because you look at different cases. And the way that I experienced it a lot of times, because I you know I dealt with this a lot um, in just about every case. Um, but it, it seems like it's you can get a lot of inconsistencies uh, where a judge might be looking at even in the same circuit a judge might be looking at this issue well that's not similar enough or well this one is you know just right on point or that one's not quite there and just like you were describing um, you know where you might have oh well this this happened this prisoner was you know was had an overflowing toilet for four days but we've never dealt with somebody who only had it for three days um, whereas you would think the principles are pretty similar uh, but, but I mean, have you seen that? I guess looking at this overall, have you seen this as you know, kind of leading to a lot of inconsistent results? Yes, right. So that, and that's true in many ways. Um, so first, I'll just note that you know, there's kind of there are three ways to uh, to really kind of get over qualified immunity, and the one that seems it's most prominent and most controversial is this line that we've been talking about. Is there a materially similar case that's been decided before? Um, sometimes you can have occasionally, this is very, very rare. You can have text that puts someone on notice that of what they, what they were doing was violating the law. So there's a case called Grove versus Ramirez where, uh, the court said, well, look, this is what the particularity clause of the fourth amendment says needs to be in a warrant. So, and this wasn't in the warrant, therefore we don't need a case. The text is pretty clear here. Um, but that's really rare. Uh, and then somewhere in between in terms of rareness is um, obviousness. Um, and so sometimes a violation can be sufficiently 
obvious to put someone uh, on notice. I was just, uh, the other day I was interviewing another one of my former bosses, Judge Myron Thompson, and I asked him about a case that he decided, um, a qualified immunity case about hitching posts where um, uh, prisoners in Alabama were being placed on hitching posts for hours at a time in the hot Alabama sun. They weren't being given water. They were peeing on themselves and uh, and being, you know, tormented with their uh, guards were giving dogs water and being like, oh, look, dog has water and you don't even have water, things like that. And Judge Thompson wrote an opinion that said, well, this is obvious. That's why this violates qualified. That's why that's why this these officers are not entire, entitled to qualified immunity because it's obvious. Um, and the Supreme Court ultimately agreed in a case called Hope versus Peltzer. Uh, and that, that case doesn't, I think, get quite the treatment that it sometimes should. Um, we need to restore hope uh, in more ways than one. Um, but those are the kind of those are the sorts of avenues. So some of the inconsistencies to get to your question, some of the inconsistencies that you see uh, are sometimes, I think, based on what track uh, a judge or a panel really kind of goes down. Right. So, I mean, there's a judge I won't say his or her name, but there was a judge who recently they they were like, um, oh, but, you know, but you just you just cite about why it's obvious. You just make clear why it's obvious. Right, and I'm like, well, that is one approach, but that's not a that's not the only approach. And uh, the judge who said that was in a circuit where they had more leeway to do that than the, than where I live here in the in the eleventh circuit, or frankly, where you live in the eighth. Mm-hmm. So, uh, so that's um, that's but that but but so some of the inconsistencies you see operate that way. And at some point, I you know, depending on how long this doctrine exists. I might do an empirical study on how often qualified immunity gets granted across the circuits and not just that, but what strand of qualified immunity law are they citing? And, you know, and are we talking about excessive force cases or other types of cases? And actually I've collected, I'm embarrassed to say this out loud because I haven't written the article, but I've collected data from about five or six circuits, mm-hmm. uh, but haven't uh, done the, haven't run the regressions. Um, uh, but, um, but yeah, so on the listener's question about, um about subjective versus objective um so qualified immunity used to be a subjective standard so in the 1970s it used to be called good faith immunity um and uh and it had a subjective component to it it was not always clear how important the subjective element was but there appeared to be both a subjective and a and a and a, and a, and a, a both an objective and a subjective component right so like what did this officer actually know and what should this officer have known that proved to be pretty unpopular among both plaintiffs and lawyers and defend and defendants uh plaintiffs lawyers didn't like having to demonstrate subjectivity because that's a very hard thing to demonstrate especially without um without discovery um, but even with discovery, that can be a hard thing to show. And defendants didn't like it because it meant sometimes that you ended up in very uh, in these things that looked almost like trials to try to figure out what the subjective intentions of the officer were. So some judges were having hearings, right? And let alone like depositions. Some judges were having hearings where they were to kind of flesh out what the motives of the officer were. And so the defendants were like, well, goodness, like. I thought the whole point was to avoid trial. And plaintiffs were like, well, goodness, this is really hard to demonstrate. Um, and that's how you end up with a unanimous opinion in Harlow, uh, where uh, it, it's a balance of, you kind of have this interest convergence um, from plaintiffs and defendants to settle on a, a, an objective doctrine. And uh, and I think, again, we're at a similar potential moment of interest convergence with respect to textualism and accountability. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, it's... Uh... Yeah, man, having those hearings, that's just, <laughs> that's something you see today, that's for sure. Uh, yeah, I, I, uh, and, and Dina's been watching, um, she's in southwest Missouri, good friend, uh, and she wrote, you know, I think that most people just want them to be able to be held responsible when they commit crime, just like everyone else. And, and to be clear, so this doctrine, uh, it applies in those civil cases, those federal civil rights cases, um, for those of you who uh, are familiar, the Section 1983 cases um, is how these, you know, most often look. But um, uh, for criminal, uh, this this isn't the situation. So for for the criminal cases, the qualified immunity, all that stuff doesn't doesn't apply. Um, but I mean, it, it's interesting because a lot of times, 
Um, and, you know, uh, we're going to be seeing probably a whole lot of this, but uh, you get to that criminal side of things and, and the standard is higher. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of defenses there for how quickly somebody had to react and all these things. And you get a jury and a jury decides one way or another. Um, sometimes the, the only way to really get accountability is through the civil side of all of this. Yeah, you know, and, I, and I feared this a little bit about um, it's nuanced, and I guess it's really kind of the job of folks who get it uh, and who under who you know not because we're smart or whatever, but because this is literally what we spend our life reading about. Like it's, I think it is our job to really kind of make it clear. And then I think that's why I find myself so often saying it's not just qualified immunity, y'all, because right. um, and so let alone what, what you're talking about, right, which is the criminal aspect of this. Like, how do we reform that? Like, how do we make sure that investigations are independent? Um, and how do we uh, make sure that, you know, there's a realistic chance of someone being charged? How do we make sure that there's not a prosecutor kind of doing a kind of wink, wink thing in front of grand juries that, that let them know that they probably should indict? Like, what do we... Um, I, the criminal law side of this is really important. How do we I mean, do? Do we have it right with respect to police unions? Um, you know, so people get really uh, upset when they see somebody get shot in the back when they're running away, or um, or they you know they know that someone had a no knock warrant in plain clothes and shot someone who was asleep, or um, when they see someone put their knee on someone's neck for eight minutes and 46 seconds and they say, wait, why? Like, if I did that, I would be arrested immediately. Why are they still out? Right. And that actually doesn't have anything to do with qualified immunity. That has to do with a lot of other things. Again, the independence of investigations, but also a lot that's built into police union contracts. Um, and so, uh, you know, it's a there, there has to be a holistic fix here. And my, one fear I have, right, you, you know, if, if if we pass a bill that changes qualified immunity, will I be glad about that? Sure, of course. Mm -hmm. Will I be ecstatic? Will I feel like time to celebrate, right? Uh, we've done it. No, absolutely not. Because that's just, that's, again, it doesn't, that won't even fix the, all of the civil issues, let alone, right, what you're talking about, which is that people are just like, if I did that, I mean, why? Like, are they are they literally above the law? I knew they were enforcing the law, but are they above the law? Like, if I shot someone in the back who was running away, it wouldn't take. I mean, in Breonna Taylor's case, God, it's been weeks and weeks and weeks. I mean, it it wouldn't take that long. So why? And in Atlanta, recently, I mean, we've had cases where people have been officers have been arrested like almost instantly, mm -hmm. uh, and I, and I think there's lots of reasons for that. Um, but let's be clear, Atlanta's going to get sued because uh, the high likelihood is that, um, in fact, in one instance, Atlanta's already been sued because there are police contracts that, that's, that make it really hard to do what just happened here. Um, and, uh, and so, and I don't think cities should always have to make a decision. Are we going to, are we going to break the contract and pay the officer in order to keep the peace? Um, and hold the officer accountable like we do everyone else, or are we not going to hold the officer accountable like everyone else, uh, and and face the wrath of the American public? Um, so yeah, we there's, there's just so many pieces of this, and and the important the great thing is that people are asking these questions because we, we can't get to the answer unless people are demanding um, demanding that we all do. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, you know, one of the one of the worries I have is because the term qualified immunity seems to be like so. And a lot of folks are just like, well, you know, they're, maybe they're just hearing about it for the first time now or they're a little bit familiar with it. Um, but but when you sound like, oh, look, we've got we've got this thing we can get rid of and it's going to fix all of this stuff. That's what the worry I have so much is like, no, like that's not like, OK, sure. You know, you're going to get a piece of it, just like you said. But. But I just worry that, you know, we're, we're for some folks, it's like, well, we did that. So we're, we're good here. Like we made a change. And that was a big deal. That's been in the cases and all the it, it just because there's like a lot of mystery around it almost. And it sounds like this 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 really big concept and such a big change. Look at these reforms that we're making. You know, it scares me a little bit that folks are just going to say, well, look, we did that. And now we can move on and wait for the next one because that's a fix. So, um, yeah, I agree. I, you know, I wonder, there was an interesting question in here and I don't know if you've seen this. 
Um, but it's about uh, expenditures. Has anybody estimated city expenditures based on cases dismissed and potential cases if qualified immunity was ended? Um, so I don't know. Ha have you seen anybody with like a cost estimate of what getting for the qualified immunity would be? I haven't necessarily. To, I don't think I've seen a cost estimate. I think that the the article that I would direct the reader to um, or to the, the, the viewer to is another Joanna Schwartz piece. Yeah, um, I'm gonna have to call her next. I'm gonna have to. <laughs> should, you absolutely should call her. Uh, I mean, she, her, she. I mean, I've I've written one piece about qualified immunity. She and uh, she's written the bulk of the empirical work in this in this space. Uh, and and Will Bode is credited with kind of the the bulk of the textualist case against qualified immunity. Um, uh, and I'm along for the ride because I've written some about it and, and understand it. But they they're they're the they've been at the forefront here. Um, so uh, so she has a piece called After Qualified Immunity. And uh, and that's and that's precisely what she attempts to kind of explore. But I don't think she has any any hard numbers. Um, one thing that I'll just note is um, that in many of these instances, we kind of imagine that it's coming out of the the budget, the regular budget. That it's you know that it's that you know like right now Atlanta we're passing our budget. There's going to be a general fund. There will be some amount set aside for uh, settling lawsuits. But actually, when it comes to a lot of this liability, um, especially in the police context, it's insurance mm -hmm. proceeds uh, that end up paying for this. And so, um, so you know, I, I don't want, I don't want readers, I don't want viewers, excuse me. I'm so used to saying readers. I need to, <laughs> um, I need to start learning to say listeners and viewers as I'm doing more and more of these kind of okay. podcasts. Um, but, uh, but, um, but, but what I don't want um, viewers to uh, to think is that, oh, oh goodness, that means that the city will go bankrupt. Um, I think that is an important thing to think about when it comes to suing cities, but keep in mind that's actually not the whole, uh, that's not the whole ballgame. There's, there are insurance proceeds that play a role here too. Yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, cause a lot of them do have, I mean, some are self-insured, some entities are, but, um, yeah, a lot of, a lot of the insurance, and you, you, you would think that, you know, I mean, you would think that insurance costs would go up if, if there's, you know, but, but then oftentimes, you know, with the insurance companies, they want to stay in business. They're in this marketplace. So they're going to probably have some requirements uh, for you to change some policies or ways that you're doing training. And, you know, there's some just, I mean, looking at that system, there's going to be some market pressures on departments and, and different entities to, to, you know, really implement some of these reforms already as a result of that. So. And the leading scholar on that score is John Rappaport, uh, who's at the University of Chicago Law School, and he's written specifically about insurance contracts. Um, and uh, and so yes, yeah, so that's I think that's exactly right. You place if you place sufficient uh, economic pressure on the insurance company because they don't want to be they they're not going to go broke. Um, they might start demanding things like let's you know you you know you need here's what you need in the way of accountability for us to insure you. Need specifically in the way of training in order for us to ensure you, um, and so on and so forth. Right? Uh, here's here's what can't be in your union contract if you want us to ensure you. Um, there there might be some uh, some market pressure there beyond the the um, the legislative fixes. Mm -hmm. Right.
I, mean, I was just muted for all of that. I was being very profound, I think, for a little bit. Uh, yeah, so, no, I'm back. I'm sorry, everybody. Thanks for letting me know, and I'll try to edit that. But no, I was saying is, uh, a so AJ's um, comment is really interesting in terms of, you know, different states and who's in leadership will have uh, biases uh, based on who's in control. Um, and we had Professor Roger Goldman, for those of you who have watched before, um, but he is an expert in police decertification. And he came on and he talked about how actually in states that are often, you know, considered more liberal, uh, but have stronger police unions that they have had um, a lot of trouble with uh, this specific issue and actually having that happen. So it, it could be, you know, interesting where you see some of those changes getting made and how different states, um, you know, what, what the, the actual action or, or the, the outcome is um, if this does become like a state by state kind of reform. But a lot of this, because it is in, in, in federal case law, um, you know, a lot of this is going to be based on what you know, U.S. Congress is going to want to do. Yeah. So for, you know, for the federal constitutional lawsuits, right, so the ones that are based in the Fourth Amendment, um, which uh, is, uh, makes unlawful uh, or unreasonable searches and seizures, it makes those unconstitutional. Um, and that includes then the use of unreasonable force while seizing someone. That's why that's a Fourth Amendment uh, matter. Um, or when it comes to the Eighth Amendment, um, which is excessive force in the prisons. Um, those, the, the primary fix has to come from the Supreme Court or from Congress. Um, and that's just because uh, the enforcement mechanisms for enforcing the federal constitution, the primary ones come from federal law. Um, and kind of these doctrines like qualified immunity, they find themselves even profit com coming up into state court when someone is relying on the federal constitution. But yeah, but I mean, clearly, right, states have a very major role to play here too um, when it comes to state lawsuits, um, but then when also when it comes to what do you put in place to so you don't get to the lawsuit in the first place. Like, like, so, I mean, once you're at the point of lawsuit and accountability, right, someone's already been injured or died or has had their rights violated. And, and states are in a particularly good position to think about how do we how do we stop this? What do we do? How do we how do we reimagine? How do we re, how do we reform police contracts? How do we how do we reform uh, approaches to insurance, et cetera? Um, and how do we potentially reimagine policing? Um, uh, to borrow a phrase that is in the news quite a bit right now, and is the title of a bill that the Atlanta City Council is debating right this very second that we are talking right now yeah yeah when we tune, when we tune off here i'm going to go listen to what they're saying oh good okay well i'll get you off then so you can go <laughs> that's very important i do want to ask though in that vein since i've got you um you know one of the uh one of the big issues that i've been talking about um is the need for missouri specifically at the attorney general's office i think you talked about you know a lot of these reforms we had a whole ferguson commission report that had a whole lot of recommendations and we haven't really implemented very many of them, one of which was having the attorney general uh, uh, really take that role of being that independent prosecutor in a lot of these situations. We actually just have a situation over in Sedalia in Pettis County um, where uh, a, a lady was shot and killed um, by uh, a deputy and the state highway patrol has taken over the investigation there. Because you want some independence and you want, you know, you, we need legitimacy in the system and you need to instill faith and, and, you know, belief that it's going to, that at least the, the process is fair, um, which is just so fundamental to our system here. But one of the big proposals I've had is for the attorney general's office in Missouri to join a lot of other states and have a civil rights division in the office. Um, you know, I wonder, you know, looking at what's happening in Atlanta and all of your involvement and may, I wish I could have you for another hour. Maybe we'll have you back because this is, you just got so much, um, I'm definitely dorking out on this one right now, but, uh, what would you like to see, you know, having looked at a lot of these issues, I know all of you, there, there's a whole bunch of coordinating work that we have to do to make sure it works. Um, you can't just sometimes take one piece of the puzzle, like you said, and think that you're going to fix the whole thing with it. What do you? What would you like to see on the local um, and statewide levels, um, if you even think that that's the right way to go? Yeah, no, I mean, I, I like the idea of uh, of independent investigations generally, right? Um, 
you know, here uh, when our DA prosecuted the person who killed Rayshard Brooks, um, you know, a li- it has been reported that the next night, a lot of officers didn't show up for work. Um, and, and so what you, the blue flu, um, it can impact kind of, you know, whether or not officers show up, but it also is going to impact the just general relationship between the officers and the local prosecutor and local prosecutors need officers. They need them to investigate. They need them to testify. They need, they need, they need to have a, a decent, working relationship um and so because of that there's going to sometimes be incentives for prosecutors local prosecutors not to um not to treat police the way that they treat every, the rest of us um and so an independent investigation and and a, and a place for an independent an independent investigation i think is important um i also think that there should be maybe some more opportunities for uh governments to sue recalcitrant police departments. Uh, so there's, uh, you know, at the federal level, there's um, a, a statute, I believe it's 42 USC 14141, um, which allows uh, the federal government to sue for pattern and practice violations. Um, I think it could be a very healthy thing to allow um, other entities to do this too, including state attorney general's offices, because um, they they're going to know their states particularly well, and it kind of also um, lessens some of the some of the federalism concerns if they're the plaintiff. Um, and a, and a, I think a civil rights division could be a healthy place for something like that. Um, so those are just a few thoughts. But all in all, um, it sounds like a um, quite good idea to have a civil rights division in an attorney general's office. Well, um, thank you so much. I really appreciate you coming on. Are there, are there any uh, words of wisdom, anything else that you'd like to leave everybody with? I know it's, uh, you know, uh, just, I mean, this is such an important topic. And I, you know, I really appreciate all the education that you provided today for so many folks, uh, yeah. me included, because this is great to hear about, you know, all the different papers and everything else out there. But um, yeah, I mean, I wonder if there's any, you know, any thoughts that you have that we may, maybe I didn't, you know, get to ask you about that you, you'd like to share with everybody before uh, we sign on up. Uh, keep the faith, keep hope alive. Mm-hmm. But, uh, you know, and I, I say that kind of in jest, but not entirely. Um, there are legal solutions to these problems. I mean, there, there is a place for law here. Um, but at the end of the day, I think the most important thing is, uh, with respect to movements like this, um, is how it's kind of forcing us to see each other's mutual humanity, um, for us to have a better understanding of our past and of the structures that got us to where we are. Um, and if we do a better job of atoning and understanding, um, then I think some of the policy solutions will be more forthcoming. Um, and there'll be f- there, there'll be fewer instances of these things in the first place if we learn to all see each other's uh, mutual humanity, um, and that's not just a law thing; that's a that's a heart thing. Um, and so I am heartened um, that people across the country um, are expressing um, such uh, vigorous enthusiasm uh, for the idea that um, that all of us um, must treat each other with respect and with dignity and with humanity. Professor Fred Smith, Jr., Emory University School of Law. Thank you so much for coming on. I really appreciate having you here. Um, Thank you. Folks, uh, yeah, thanks for tuning in, everybody. We really appreciate it. Um, Thank you all. Uh, This has been a great podcast. I'm I'm, I'm so happy we had them. And, uh, folks, if if you're looking for anything, you know where to find me. We're at allodgross.org and would love to have your help. So uh, we'll talk to you all soon. You all take care and stay safe.